Well, it's good to see you back this evening with us. We're glad to see all the smiling faces. It's been a beautiful day, hasn't it? And to be here with the, the our brothers and sisters in Christ just makes it that much better. You know, this is the closest we're going to get to heaven here on earth. And that song that we just sang, This World's Not Our Home, is the title of this lesson this evening. This is not our home. We are pilgrims here. Meaning we're only here for a little while and we're going somewhere else. This is not a permanent situation as some try to believe that it is. We're only here for a little while. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. If this world is in our home, then we need to think in along those same lines and not treat it as if it were our permanent home. Our mindset is a very important factor in how we deal with each and every situation we encounter. How we think, how we feel, where our priorities are, all have consequences in how we deal with each circumstance we find ourselves in. And Paul here is telling us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Come out from among them. We're to think this way. We're not part of the world. We're separate from the world. We have to come out from among them. What do we do when we come out? Well, we do a lot of things when we come out from among the world. When we come out from among the world, we draw attention to ourselves. We set the standard for what they are to be doing. We demonstrate God's will to them. We teach them by our actions and our choices. We are the light. The world focuses on us and they are drawn to us. We share our hope, our faith with them. Well, there's lots and lots of things that are results of our coming out from among them. I've got some points I want you to think about this evening. Number one, we cannot be friends with the world. You're not to be part of the world. You're to be separate. You therefore cannot be friends with the world. Look at James chapter 4, verse 4. James 4 and verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is the enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's just putting it right on the nailhead, isn't it? You can't argue with that. God is stating very clearly, you cannot be a friend of the world, you can't love things that are in the world, and say you belong to me. I have told you to separate yourself from them. I told you to renew your mind, Philippians. I told you to have the mind of Christ. To think like Him, feel like Him. I told you to don the, on the armor of God as you go out into the world. I told you to put on Christ as you go out into the world. Everything that God has told us to do separates us from the world. All the way down to our choices that we are to make. So if I choose to be a friend to the world, meaning I choose to love and partake in something that's in the world, as opposed to choosing God, I have made myself the enemy of God. That's not the condition we want to be in, is it? God destroys His enemies. There is no enemy that can stand before God. Period. So why would we want to put ourselves in that position? By the choices that we make. We have to learn not to love the things that are in the world. It's not hard to understand that. There's a friend of, of Paul's that chose Demas. He chose to be to love the world. He just separated from us, Paul said. He's gone back into the world. This should be an example for us. Don't turn your back on the Lord. Any man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not what? Worthy. Remember the example we have in Lot's wife? She was running. She was told, don't look back. She did. And turned into a pillar of salt. 
God has given us examples. He said, don't love the world, love me. We shouldn't have, find that a difficult decision, should we? Number two, we must endeavor not to be spotted by this world. <coughs> James chapter 1, verse 27. We must endeavor, do our best not to let the world spot us. <coughs> Think of ourselves as wearing a clean garment and something gets splashed on it. We're being spotted or stained by the world in some way. We need to avoid that. Listen to what God says in James 1.27. Pure religion, meaning that which is complete, that which is unspotted, unpolluted, is completely pure. And undefiled <clears throat> before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know, some people would find that hard to understand. Well, how can I do that? I live in the world. I, I make a living in the world. I have friends in the world. I, I have family that's part of this world. How do I keep myself unspotted from the world? You do it by the choices that you make. That's how you do it. We can't choose our family but we can choose the ones we hang around with. Well, I, if I'm related to a, my grand, grandfather that was a, a Jehovah's Witness. That wasn't my choice. I can't have, do anything about that. But I can make the right choices and not follow in these footsteps. I can follow God. I can follow the Word of God instead. That's an example of making the choices. That's what God's saying. You make the right choices. It's like Paul says, I all things, I can do all things. I'm free to make any choice I want to make. But some of them are not expedient, he says. Meaning, some of them are just not the right choices. I can do anything I choose to do. But some of them don't benefit me. Some of those choices wouldn't benefit my brother in Christ. Some of them wouldn't benefit my neighbor. You see, the choices we make not only affect us, they affect those that are around us. Our family, our friends, the ones that we're supposed to be leading to the Lord. How do I keep myself unspotted from the world? I look before I leave. I do as God has said to do, be vigilant and sober-minded, and I examine the world around me before I take a step so I know where I'm going and what I'm doing is what God would approve of. That's how I do that. That's having the mind of Christ. I'll read you a scripture here in a moment where the Lord talks about that. And you'll understand better without making the choices. <clears throat> Number three, we cannot find approval in this world. Listen carefully. We cannot find approval in this world. Romans 1, 32. Romans chapter 1, verse 32. If I'm doing something in the world and the world is telling me, oh, that's wonderful, that's great. You're one of us. Then I'm, I'm going the wrong direction. Okay? Listen carefully to the scripture and you'll understand. Who knowing the judgment of God, <clears throat> that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. In other words, they're getting the approval of those that do those things. This means that I'm in agreement with something that the world is doing. I'm not standing against it. I'm not saying that's wrong. 
I'm always going on and I'm winking at it or I'm kind of turning away from it where I'm not really paying attention but I know what's going on. So since I'm not drawing attention to it, the world says, leave them alone, they're okay. They're not bothering us. We are not to find approval in the world. We are to stand against the evil of this world by proclaiming God's will. The only approval, beloved, we should ever seek is that from God. We ought to obey God rather than man, simply put. When I see something that's going on that is against God's will, I am to stand up and say no. I will not agree to that. I will not condone it. I will not go along with it. It is wrong. That is our responsibility. The scripture tells us very clearly, know you not that you will judge the world. We're judging the world when we stand up and proclaim the will of God. But I'm not a judge on a throne. And I'm not executing my personal judgment. I am dictating the will of God. That is what a Caruso does. That is a preacher. He proclaims the will of the king. That's what that word means. Our king is Christ. His law is what we abide by. So when I stand up and say, no, God would not condone that. God is against that. I am against it. I am proclaiming the judgment of God. Therefore, I am judging the world, saying, no, don't do that. That is wrong. God is the final judge. God is the one who will execute judgment. And he will use his word, the one that we're to be proclaiming, as the basis for his judgment. John 12, 48, man hath one that judgeth him in the last day, even my word shall judge him in the last day. So we're not to seek the approval of the world, we're to set the standard the world is to look to and follow. See, right now the world is trying to get us to go along with, oh, quit condemning us. Who are, you just hate speech when you talk about uh, not loving us and, and uh, that we're doing wrong and so on and so forth. No. <coughs> that's proclaiming the will of God. You're doing something that's wrong and God doesn't approve it. It's my job to point it out. Just like Paul said, I now become thine enemy because I told you the truth. We cannot seek the approval of the world. We must always seek the approval of God. And His approval only. Number four, we cannot love this present world. Love being where our heart is. Look in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. And verse 17, we'll all break. <clears throat> neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let's just stop right there and not go too far. If I choose to love something in this world and I love it to the point that it consumes my attention and my feelings and my heart, then I cannot love God. That's what that is saying. God is a jealous God. He says, love me. <coughs> Seek me, serve me. If I put something in front of God, whether it be my job, my friends, my family, money, prestige, fame, whatever the category, if I put that in front of God, then I have said, God, you don't mean as much to me as I thought. I like this better. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Majority of those things I mentioned would come into the category of the pride of life. Look at me, look what I have done. Look at me, I'm famous. Look at me, I'm proud of my accomplishments. I'm putting myself and my fame and my fortune in front of serving God. You cannot do that. Let's go on. Verse 16. For all that is in the world, that's everything. That doesn't leave anything out. That means money, pride, prestige, fame, fortune. 
the elements of this world, whether it be gold and diamonds or property or whatever, all of that. Neither the things that are in, the, I'm sorry, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. It deteriorates, it goes away. Have you ever noticed that everything in the world that you want, that you desire, that you may acquire, you have to redo it again? I love coconut cream pie. That's one of my favorite. I well, love it when that gets made for me, especially around Thanksgiving time, because that's about the only time I get it. It doesn't last very long. I sure want it again. What about that when you're out in the summertime in the heat? Oh, it's hot. A good old glass of ice cold sweet tea is sure good. Once it's gone, I want another one. What about making money? You make the money and you go buy yourself the deed, you pay your rent, you pay your bills, or you maybe have enough little left over, need to replace tires on your truck or your car, put gas in there, whatever. And that money sure doesn't last for a long time. I gotta go get some more. What about when you do something? that you're recognized for. Maybe you get a, your name on a plaque on a building somewhere or something. Or you might win an award. Or you feel good about that for a while, but soon everything's back to normal. You're just yourself again. That thing and that fortune didn't last very long, did it? You see, everything that's in the world that can bring you any form of pleasure whatsoever, whether it have to do, has to do with the pride of life, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh is irrelevant. What category it's in, it never lasts. When God says it passes the way, those that ends in an ETH, that means it's a continuous process of being there and going away. Not only will it be destroyed and terminated when the Lord returns, but even while you have it, it is in the process of going away. So God's giving you a little bit of wisdom here. He's saying, don't love the things that are in the world. They're not going to last. Just don't do it. Don't put your priorities there. Matter of fact, Paul tells us to lay up treasure in heaven. Look to heaven. Put your treasures up there because up there, they don't go away. They're eternal. They, they, nobody steals them. The stock market doesn't crash and you lose everything. Everything that's up there is something that will last. Look at the continuation of that. <clears throat> and the, the verse 17, And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, but abides forever. I'm going to live eternally, and I know you do too. But God's telling you, don't put your treasures in this world, because where your heart is, where your treasure is, that's where your focus is. That's where your feelings are. That's where your emotions are attached. That's what you think of. Think of God. Think of heaven. Keep your chin up. Look up above. Paul even says, look above. Focus on Christ. Focus on heaven. Focus on God. Focus on His will. Not only will it help you to maintain your faith, but in the end, that's all that's going to matter anyway. Because you will abide forever. In other words, you won't die. You'll have eternal life. But all that you've put your heart and mind into will be there too. So we need to learn to understand what he's saying here. Don't love this world. Love God. Love. Period. For love is of God. And what does the scriptures tell us very clearly? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Because he gives you his righteousness. You don't have your own. <coughs> All of these things will be added up to you. In other words, God will make sure you have everything you need. I don't have to love the world. I have to love God. 
and he'll take care of me in whatever capacity I need. Because I am his treasure here. Number five, our pattern in life. <clears throat> our pattern in life cannot be of this world. Look around us. Look what's happening in the world. The moment you turn on the TV, so-and-so's been shot, so-and-so's been stabbed, oh, so-and-so has committed to such and such a crime, and he's now on trial for this, he's on trial for that, oh, the world the economy is this, the tariffs in China are this, and, oh, there's catastrophe everywhere. Every single thing that man has ever tried to do on his own has failed. So why in the world would I want to model my life and the pattern of my life after something that's already been proven to have failed? We need to learn to look to God for all things as He has commanded us to do. Even the pattern of how we live. Look in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't pattern your life after the pattern of this world. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How much more clear can God make it? He tells me to be holy because He's holy. You model your life after me. Paul says, be imitators of me even as I am of Christ. He modeled himself in the way he thinks, in the way he lived after the pattern Christ set. Our pattern needs to be God's pattern. The pattern we find in the will of God and through the example of Christ's life. We need to pattern ourselves after that not conforming or patterning our lives after the world that is around us. The world is in sin and it's in darkness. It's in turmoil. It's agitated. It is definitely the work of Satan. If you stop and look, everything that's going on in this world around us, something bad is happening. We don't need to think like that. We need to rescue people that are in the world. I can't rescue someone if I can't rescue myself. I can't help someone if I can't help it myself. <coughs> we need to pattern our life after the will of God, according to the life of Christ. Pattern ourselves, think as God wants us to think. When we are able to do that, then we're able to help those who are desperately in need of help around us, whether it be our brothers or sisters in Christ, need to be lifted up and encouraged or our neighbor down the street that's lost in sin and doesn't know what way to go we can show them because we've already been down that road what speaks loudest saying I know or having the experience to know how to die now, if you go on a trail somewhere like in Yellowstone Park or somewhere you want to find the newest hiker and guide or do you want to find someone that's been up that mountain a few times knows where the cracks and crevices are knows where the pitfalls are knows where the rock slide is I want to find somebody who knows so that I can go and tour this park or this mountain and come back down again you see we can help we can fulfill the will of God we can teach the lost when we learn how to pattern our lives not after this world, but after God. And that's our responsibility. Number six, this world cannot control our heart. We cannot let that happen. And all the devil is good, the devil is good at tempting and trying. He's good at pulling at the heart strings. God, as a matter of fact, God's warned us about that. <clears throat> because our heart is feelings. 
And if we let our feelings run our life rather than our reason, then we're in trouble. Listen to John chapter 14 and verse 30. John chapter 14 and verse 30. This is the one I was telling you about. Christ talking. You know, help us to better understand how to keep ourselves away from the world. John chapter 14 and verse 30. The Lord is speaking here. He says, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh. He's talking about the devil. The devil was coming. And listen to what he says. And have nothing in me. What he's saying is, the devil's going to come and try me, but he has no hold on my heart. He has no hold on my feelings. The Lord was here to fulfill the will of God and to do what God had commanded him to do. The devil, though he tried, could not tempt Christ because he had no hold on his heart. His heart was dedicated to God. His love was dedicated to God. His obedience was in line with God's will. Nothing the devil could do would work. <coughs> That is how we are to think. That is how we are to be. As long as we let our feelings and emotions in some way, some fashion, be attached to the world around us, the devil has strings that he can play with and yank on and tempt us and try us and jerk us around. We need to sever those ties with the world and love God. Let our strings be pulled our heartstrings be plucked and pulled by our Lord and not by the devil. As long as we let the world be an influence on our heart, we will always struggle to keep the faith. Whether it be a family member that tries us and pulls on us, a friend down the street, a relative, a child, mother or father it doesn't matter as long as there are ties to this world that we have not severed the devil will play with us in our hearts and our feelings and that's how many of us fall <clears throat> the devil's not going to tempt you and try you with something that he knows you're strong enough to resist. But if he can use a child against you, if he can use a relative against you, a friend, a friend's influence, a peer pressure, he's going to do it. Because as long as you have ties to this world in that fashion, your probability of falling is great. Because you can only be strong for so long then you will fall. This is why the Lord was able to resist Satan's temptations. Because he had no pull on his heart. No influence. Every time that he was tempted, how did he answer? It is written. His allegiance was to God. Where our allegiance should be as well. His love was centered upon the Father. I love the Father and He loves me. That's where our love needs to be as well. Number seven. We must not cast our lot with this world. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 32. Let's go ahead and read verse 31 as well. 31 and 32. <clears throat> For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. <coughs> Listen carefully to what Paul is saying. For if we would judge ourselves, how are we to judge ourselves? Paul tells you very clearly, remember the Bible explains itself. He tells us very clearly, examine yourself. You look at your heart. You look at your life. Is your life in alignment with the Word of God? His exact words are, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. I judge me using the very Word of God that's going to judge me. God has pulled no punches with us. He has laid out His Word and says, Here, this is what I'm going to judge you by. You live according to this, and you're alright. Because this is what I'm going to look at when I examine your life, when you stand before me. So before that occurs, why can't I look at the Word of God and judge for myself? Am I doing what God's told me to do? Or am I listening to the world? See, if I cast my lot with the world and say, I want to take my chances, as many in the world are doing, and say, oh, God is love. God loves me. God knows what my heart is, and He's not going to punish me. He knows I care. I've done many good things. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22. The only ones that are going to go to heaven will be the ones who do the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many will in that last day say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That means proclaimed you, preached about you, told the world about you. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Fed the hungry, fed the children, housed people, whatever good you want to think of. They've done it. And in thy name, that means by your authority, have cast out demons. Those are people who believe that they have done good things. And they've done it to glorify God. Because they've done it in His name. What does the Lord say? Then I will profess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Iniquity is sin. For I never knew you. See, we can't cast our lot with the world. We can't put ourselves in the world and say, I'm a good person. I believe in God. I go to church. I'm a good person. So God's going to forgive me. I just know He will. That's what the world says. It's called pluralism. I have my truth. You have your truth. I'm a good person. We're on the same track. We're serving the same God. We're going to go to the same place. I've heard that on how many times. No. We cast our lot with God. We judge ourselves. We examine the Word, whether we're in the faith or not. We judge ourselves. And then what did Paul say? But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. In other words, when we're reading the Scripture, we're studying the Word of God, and I find I've done something wrong, it's God that corrects me. He chastens me. He tells me, get your life in order. This, you're doing this wrong. Make it right. That's what that's saying. That we should not be condemned. What The world is going to be condemned. Those that are in the world are lost. If we put our lot with them, we are saying to ourselves, I'm going to be lost. I don't want to be lost. And I know you don't want to be lost. So let's not cast our lot with the world. Because this is not our home anyway, is it? Heaven's where we want to be. And for us to be citizens of heaven, we have a law that we follow, and that's called the law of Christ. The only way we become citizens of the kingdom of heaven is to be born again, born into the kingdom of heaven. Born of water and of the Spirit. <clears throat> then we are citizens of heaven. God imparts His righteousness to, it, to us. Romans chapter 5, and we are in grace, for you are saved by grace. Right? I'm in grace by God's gift, and I remain faithful to God, and in the end, I will be with you. Because this is not my home. 
This is only a stopping point. In the timeline of eternity, that God has set apart for us and us alone. So let's not think of this world as our home. Let's look to God. Let's separate ourselves from this world in whatever capacity. Let us always be remain true to God's word. If we love Him, we're going to keep His commandments. If you're here this evening, and you need the prayers of the church. You need to put your Lord on the baptism, whatever capacity you need to respond to the Lord's invitation that's extended to you at this time. Whatever we can do for you in Christ, let us do it for you this evening. Once you come all together, we stand in right to the song. <laughs>